peak oil and the long descent, including the myth of the idea of progress and apocalyptic futures. Gradual disintegration, not sudden catastrophic collapse, is the way civilizations end. On average, it takes about 250 years for a civilization to complete the process of decline and fall. This casts a startling light on the crisis we face as we collide with the limits to growth. It took the Western world more than two centuries of incremental change to transform itself from an agrarian society to its current status. Now, with its resource base failing and the consequences of its maltreatment of nature piling up around it, it faces the common fate of civilizations. Yet, if that fate follows its usual timeline, it could easily take two or more centuries of incremental change to transform the industrial world to an agrarian society again. Startling as this seems, it's supported by telling evidence. Consider our dwindling oil resources. The Hubert Curve tracks production over time for any scale of oil reserve from a single oil well up to a planet. It's a bell-shaped curve. Oil comes slowly at first, rises to peak production, then falls gradually to zero. The peak arrives when roughly half the oil is gone. The crucial point here is that after the peak, oil production declines at about the same rate it rose before. If peak comes around 2010, production in 2040 will likely equal something not far from the production in 1980, about 20 billion barrels. Oil produced in 2040 will have to meet the needs of a much larger global population and a world in crisis, but 20 billion barrels is still a lot of oil. In the same way, as reserves are depleted and production continues to slump over the decades that follow, the available oil will fall further and further below the levels needed to maintain a modern industrial society. But for a long time to come, there will still be some petroleum available. To misquote T.S. Eliot, this is the way the oil ends. Not with a bang, but a trickle. Other fossil fuels and uranium are headed the same way, but all of them can help cushion declining oil production for a while before they hit their own Hubert peaks. Renewable energy sources can provide only a small fraction of the energy we now get from fossil fuels, but that fraction can help cushion the decline and screech uh, dwindling fossil fuel reserves. The dilemma we face isn't having no energy at all. It's having to make do with less and less each year until finally we get down to levels that can be sustained indefinitely. The long descent. Map the likely results of current trends onto a scale of human lifespans and a compelling image of the future emerges. Imagine an American woman born in 1960. She sees the gas lines of the 1970s, the short-term political gimmicks that papered over the crisis in the 1980s and the 1990s, and the renewed trouble in the following decades. Periods of economic and political crisis, broken by intervals of partial recovery, shaped the rest of her life. By the time she turns 70, she lives in a beleaguered 
malfunctioning city where nearly half the population has no reliable access to clean water, electricity, or health care. Shantytowns spread in the shadow of skyscrapers, while political and economic leaders keep insisting that things are getting better. Her great-grandson, born in 2040, manages to avoid the smorgasbord of diseases, the pervasive violence, and the pandemic alcohol and drug abuse that claim a quarter of his generation before age 30. A lucky break gets him into a technical career, safe from military service and endless overseas wars or pacification actions against separatist guerrillas at home. His technical knowledge consists mostly of rules of thumb for effective scavenging. Cars and refrigerators are luxury items he will never own. His home lacks electricity and central heating, and his health care comes from an old woman whose grandmother was a doctor and who knows something about wound care and herbs. By the time his hair turns gray, the squabbling regions that were once the United States have split apart. All remaining fuel and electrical power have been commandeered by new regional governments, and coastal cities have been abandoned to the rising oceans. For his great-granddaughter, born in 2120, the great crisis are mostly things of the past. She grows up amid a ring of villages that were once suburbs, but now they surround an abandoned core of rusting skyscrapers that are visited only by salvage crews who mine them for raw materials. Local wars sputter. The oceans are still rising, and Famines and epidemics come through every decade or so. But with global population less than half of what it was in 2000 and still declining, humanity and nature are moving toward balance. The great-granddaughter learns to read and write, a skill most of her neighbors don't have. And a few old books are among her prized possessions. But the days when men walked on the moon are fading into legend. When she and her family finally set out for a village in the countryside, leaving the husk of the old city to the salvage crews, it likely never occurs to her that her quiet footsteps on a crumbling asphalt road mark the end of a civilization. This is the process named by John Michael Greer as the long descent. The declining arc of industrial civilization's trajectory through time. Like the vanished civilizations of the past, ours will likely face a gradual decline, punctuated by sudden crisis and periods of partial recovery. The fall of a civilization is like tumbling down a slope not like falling off a cliff. It's not a single massive catastrophe or even a series of lesser disasters, but a gradual slide down statistical curves that will ease modern industrial civilization into history's dumpster. Faith in progress, for example, rests on the unstated assumption that limits don't apply to us because the forward momentum of human progress automatically trumps everything else. If we want limitless supplies of energy badly enough, the logic seems to be, the world will give it to us. Of course, the world did give it to us in the form of unimaginably huge deposits of fossil fuels, storing hundreds of millions of years of worth of photosynthesis. And we wasted it in a few centuries of fantastic extravagance. The lifestyles we've grown up treating us as normal are entirely the products of that extravagance. 
This puts us in a position of a lottery winner who spent millions of dollars in a few short years and is running out of money. The odds of hitting another million dollar jackpot are minute. And no amount of wishful thinking will enable us to keep our current lifestyle by getting a job at the local hamburger stand. Fossil fuel energy and only fossil fuel energy made it possible to break with the old agrarian pattern and construct the industrial world. And unless some new and equally abundant energy source comes online fast enough to make up for fossil fuel depletion, we will find ourselves back in the same world our ancestors knew with the additional burden of a huge surplus population and an impoverished planetary biosphere to contend with. And combine these constraints with the plain, hard reality of vanishing fossil fuels and the myth of perpetual progress becomes a mirage. Believers in apocalypse, for their part, insist that the end of industrial civilization will be sudden, catastrophic, and total. That claim is just as hard to square with the realities of our predicament as the argument for perpetual progress. Every previous civilization that has fallen has taken centuries to collapse, and there's no reason to think the present case will be any different. The resource base of industrial society is shrinking, but it's far from exhausted. The impact of global warming and other ecological disruptions builds slowly over time, and governments and ordinary citizens alike have every reason to hold things together as long as possible. The history of the last century, think of the Great Depression, the Second World War, and the brutal excesses of communism and Nazism, just for starters, shows that Industrial societies can endure tremendous disruption without dissolving into a Hobbesian war of all against all. Uh, people in hard times are far more likely to follow orders and hope for the best than to turn into the rampaging, mindless mobs that play so large a role in survivalist fantasies these days. The sorry history of the Y2K non-crisis a few years ago offers a useful reminder that claims of catastrophe can be overstated. But fantasy is often more appealing than reality, and most of the apocalyptic notions in circulation these days draw very heavily on popular fantasies. The idea, common just now among some Christians, is that all good Christians will be raptured away to heaven just as the rest of the world goes to hell in a handbasket is a case in point. It's a lightly disguised fantasy of mass suicide. When you tell the kids that grandma went to heaven to be with Jesus, most people understand what that means. And it also serves as a way for people to pretend to themselves that God will rescue them from the consequences of their own actions. That's one of history's all-time bad bets, but it's certainly been a popular one. The Hollywood notion of an overnight collapse is just as much of a fantasy. It makes for great screenplays, but it has nothing to do with the realities of how civilizations fall. In the aftermath of Hubert's peak, fossil fuel production will decline gradually, not simply come to a screeching halt. And so the likely course of things is a gradual descent rather than a free fall, following the same trajectory marked out by so many civilizations in the past. Nor does decline necessarily proceed at a steady pace. Between sudden crisis come intervals of relative stability even moderate improvement. 
Different regions decline at different paces. Uh, existing social, economic, and political structures are replaced, not with complete chaos, but with transitional structures that may themselves develop pretty fair institutional strength. Does this model of punctuated decline apply to the current situation? Almost certainly. As oil and natural gas run short, economies will come unglued and political systems disintegrate under the strain. Nonetheless, there will still be oil to be had. The Hubert curve is a bell-shaped curve after all, and if the peak comes in 2010, the world in 2040 will be producing about as much oil as it was producing in 1980. With other fossil fuels well along their own Hubert curves, nearly twice as many people to provide for, and a global economy dependent on cheap, abundant energy in serious trouble, the gap between production and demand will become a potent source driving poverty, spiraling shortages, rising death rates, plummeting birth rates, and epidemic violence and warfare. Granted, this is not a pretty picture, but it's not an instant reversion to the Stone Age either.